The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, Manhood, Chapter 11. How the First Stockings Were Hung by the Chimneys. When you remember that no child, until Santa Claus began his travels, had ever known the pleasure of possessing a toy, you will understand how joy crept into the homes of those who had been favored by a visit from the good man, and how they talked of him day by day in loving tones, and were honestly grateful for his kindly deeds. It is true that great warriors and mighty kings and clever scholars of that day were often spoken of by the people, but no one of them was so greatly beloved as Santa Claus, because none other was so unselfish as to devote himself to making others happy. For a generous deed uh, uh, lives longer than a great battle or a king's decree or a scholar's essay, because it spreads and leaves its mark on all nature, and endures through many generations. The bargain made with the Nook Prince changed the plans of Claus for all future time, for being able to use the reindeer on but one night of each year, he decided to devote all the other days to the manufacture of playthings, and on Christmas Eve to carry them to the children of the world. But a, a year's work would, he knew, result in a vast accumulation of toys. So he resolved to build a new sledge that would be larger and stronger, better fitted for swift travel than the old and clumsy one. His first act was to visit the Gnome King, with uh, whom he made a bargain to exchange three drums, a trumpet, and two dolls for a pair of fine steel runners, curled beautifully at the ends. For the Gnome King had children of his own, who, living in the hollows beneath the earth, in the mines and caverns, needed something to amuse them. In three days, the steel runners were ready, and when Claus brought the playthings to the Gnome King, his majesty was so greatly pleased with them that he presented Claus a string of sweet-toned sleigh bells, in addition to the runners. Eh, these'll please a uh, glossy and flossy, said Claus as he jingled the bells and listened to their merry sound. But I should have two strings of bells, one for each deer. Bring me another trumpet and a toy cat, replied the king, and you shall have a second a string of bells like the first. <laughs> it is a bargain, said Claus, and he went home again for the toys. The new sledge was carefully built, the nooks bringing plenty of strong but thin boards to use in its construction. Claus uh, made a high, rounding uh, dashboard to keep the snow cast off uh, behind b by the fleet hoofs of the deer, and he made high sides uh, to the platform so that many toys could be carried. And finally, he mounted the sledge upon the slender steel runners made by the Gnome King. It was certainly a handsome sledge, big and roomy. Claus painted it in bright colors, although no one was likely to see it during his midnight journeys, and when all was finished, uh, he sent for a Glossy and Flossy to come and look at it. The deer admired the sledge, but gravely declared it was too big and heavy for them to draw. Yeah, we might pull it over the snow, to be sure, said uh, Glossy, but we would not pull it fast enough to enable us to visit the faraway cities and villages and return to the forest by daybreak. Oof, then I must add two more deer to my team, declared Claus after a moment's thought. The Nook a Prince allowed you as many as ten. Why not use them all? asked Flossy. Then we could speed like the lightning and leap to the highest roof with ease. A team of ten reindeer, cried Claus delightfully. That will be splendid. Uh, please return to the forest at once and select eight other deer as like yourselves as possible. And you must all eat of the Casa plant to become strong and of the Growl plant to become fleet of foot and of the Marbon plants that you may live long enough uh, to accompany my journeys. Likewise, it will be well for you to bathe in the Pool of Nares, which the lovely Queen Zerline declares will render you rarely beautiful. Should you perform these duties faithfully, there's no doubt that on next Christmas Eve, my ten reindeer will be the most powerful and beautiful steeds the world has ever seen. So, Glossy and Flossy went to the forest to choose their mates, and a Claus began to consider the question of a harness for them all. In the end, he called upon Peter Nook uh, for assistance for Peter's heart was as kind as his body was crooked, and he was remarkably shrewd as well, and Peter agreed to furnish strips of tough leather for the harness. 
This leather was cut from the skins of lions that had reached such an advanced age that they had died naturally. And on one side, the tawny hair on the other side was cured to the softness of velvet by the deaf nooks. When Claus received the strips of leather, he sewed them neatly into a harness for ten reindeer, and it proved strong and serviceable, and lasted him for many years. The harness and sledge were prepared at odd times, for Claus devoted most of his days to the making of toys. These were now much better than the first ones had been, for uh, the immortals often came to his house to watch him work and to offer suggestions. It was Nasil's idea to make some of the dolls say Papa and Mama. It was the thought of the nooks to put a squeak inside the lambs, so that when a child squeezed them, they would say, Bah! When the fairy queen visited Claus uh, to put whistles in the birds, uh, so they could be made to sing, and wheels on the horses, so the children could draw them around. Many animals perished in the forest, from one cause or another, and their fur was brought to Claus so they might cover with it small images of the beasts that he made for the playthings. A merry rill suggested that Claus make a donkey with a nodding head, which he did, and afterwards found that it amused the little ones immensely. And so the toys grew in beauty and attractiveness every day, until they were the wonder of even the immortals. When another Christmas Eve drew near, there was a monster load of beautiful gifts uh, for the children, ready to be loaded upon the big sledge. Claus filled three sacks to the brim, and tucked every corner of the sledge box full of toys besides. Then, at twilight, the ten reindeer appeared, uh, and Flossie uh, introduced them all to Claus. They were racer and pacer, reckless and speckless, fearless and peerless, and ready and steady, who, with Glossy and Flossie, made up the ten who had traversed the world these hundreds of years with their generous master. They were all exceedingly beautiful, with slender limbs, spreading antlers, velvety dark eyes, and smooth coats of fawn color spotted with white. Claus loved them at once, and has loved them ever since, for they are loyal friends and have rendered him priceless service. The new harness fitted them nicely, and soon they were all fastened to the sledge by twos, with a glossy and flossy in the lead. These wore the strings of the sleigh bells, and were so delighted with the music uh, they made that they kept prancing up and down to make the bells ring. Claus, now seated himself in the sledge, drew a warm robe over his knees and a fur cap over his ears, and cracked his long whip as a signal to start. Instantly, the ten leapt forward and uh, were away like the wind, while well, Jolly Claus laughed gleefully to see them a uh, run, and shouted the song in his big hearty voice, with a ho 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 and a ha 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 and a ho ho ha ha he, now away we go over the frozen snow as merry as we can be. There are many joys in our load of toys, as many a child will know. We'll scatter them wide on our wild night ride over the crisp and sparkling snow. Now. It was on this uh, same Christmas Eve that little Margot and her uh, brother Dick uh, and her cousins Ned and Sarah, who were visiting Margot's house, came in from making a snowman, with their clothes damp, their mittens dripping and their shoes and stockings wet through and through. And they were not scolded, for Margot's mother knew the snow was melting, but they were sent early to bed so that their clothes might be hung over the chairs to dry. The uh, shoes were placed on the red tiles of the hearth, where the heat from the hot embers would strike them, and the stockings were carefully hung in a row by the chimney, directly over the fireplace. That was the reason Santa Claus noticed them when he came down the chimney that night, and the household were fast asleep. He was in a tremendous hurry, and seeing the stockings all belonging to children, he quickly stuffed his toys into them, and dashed up the chimney again, appearing at the roof so suddenly that the reindeer were astonished at his agility. Oh, I wish they uh, would all hang up their stockings, he thought, as he drove to the next chimney. It would save me a lot of time, and then I could visit more children before daybreak. When Margot and Dick and Ned and Sarah jumped out of the bed next morning and ran downstairs to get their stockings from the fireplace, they were filled with delight to find the toys from Santa Claus in them. In fact, I think they found more uh, presents in their stockings than any other children in the city had received for Claus was in a hurry and did not stop to count the toys. Of course, they told all their little friends about it, 
And, of course, every one of them decided to hang his own stockings by the fireplace uh, next Christmas Eve. Even Bessie Blythesome, who made a visit to that city with her father, the great Lord of Lyrd, had heard the story from the children and hung up her own pretty stockings by the chimney when she returned home that Christmas Eve. On his next trip, Santa Claus found so many stockings hung up in anticipation of his visit that he could fill them in a jiffy and be away again and half the time required to hunt the children up and place the toys by their bedsides. The custom grew year by year and has always been a great help to Santa Claus. And with so many uh, children to visit, he surely needs all the help that we are able to give him. <laughs>